So I'm going to share with you from this book, Gulag Archipelago, Volume 1, some different readings. First of all, from the translator's notes, this item, the image evoked by this title, Gulag Archipelago, is that of one far-flung country with millions of natives consisting of an archipelago of islands, some as tiny as a detention cell and a railway station, and others as vast as a large Western European country contained within another country, the USSR. Its archipelago is made up of an enormous network of penal institutions and all the rest of the web of machinery for police oppression and terror imposed throughout the author's period of reference on all Soviet life. And then he talks about what gulag means. It means the, the prison system. So that was page 616, but now we're going to go back and I'm going to read to you uh, these different selections. First of all, we're going to look at the terror of night arrests. So I'm reading from pages 6 to 9. The kind of night arrest described is in fact a favorite because it has important advantages. Everyone living in the apartment is thrown into a state of terror by the first knock at the door. The arrested person is torn from the warmth of his bed. He is in a daze, half asleep, helpless, and his judgment is befogged. In a night arrest, the state security men have a superiority in numbers. There are many of them armed against one person who hasn't even finished buttoning his trousers. During the arrest and search, it is highly improbable that a crowd of potential supporters will gather at the entrance. The unhurried step-by-step -step visits, first to one apartment, then to another, tomorrow to a third and a fourth, provide an opportunity for the security operations personnel to be deployed with the maximum efficiency and to imprison many more citizens of a given town than the police force itself numbers. In addition, there is an advantage to night arrests in that neither the people in neighboring apartment houses nor those on the city streets can see how many have been taken away. Arrests which frighten the closest neighbors are no event at all to those farther away. It's as if they had not taken place. Along that same asphalt ribbon on which the Black Marias scurry at night, a tribe of youngsters strides by day with banners, flowers, and gay, untroubled songs. But those who take, whose work consists solely of arrests, for whom the horror is boringly repetitive, have a much broader understanding of how arrests operate. They operate according to a large body of theory, and innocence must not lead one to ignore this. The science of arrest is an important segment of the course on general penology, and has been propped up with a substantial body of social theory. Arrests are classified according to various criteria, nighttime and daytime, at home, at work, during a journey, first-time arrests and repeats, individual and group arrests. Arrests are distinguished by the degree of surprise required, the amount of resistance expected, even though in tens of millions of cases no resistance was expected and in fact there was none. Arrests are also differentiated by the thoroughness of the required search, by instructions either to make out or not to make out an inventory of confiscated property or seal a room or apartment, to arrest the wife after the husband had sent the children to an orphanage, or to send the rest of the family into exile, or to send the old folks to a labor camp too. No, no, arrests vary widely in form. In 1926, Irma Mendel, a Hungarian, obtained through the common turn two front row tickets to the Bolshoi Theater. Interrogator Klegel was courting her at the time, and she invited him to go with her. They sat through the show very affectionately, and when it was over, he took her straight to the Lubyanka. And if on a flowering June day in 1927 on Kuznetsky Most, the plump-cheeked, red-headed beauty Anna Skribnikova, who had just bought some navy blue material for a dress, climbed into a handsome cab with a young man about town, you can be sure it wasn't a lover's tourist at all, as the cabman understood very well and showed by his frown. He knew the organs don't pay. It was an arrest. In just a moment, they would turn on the Lubyanka and enter the black maw of the gates. And if some 22 springs later, Navy Captain 2nd Rank Boris Berkovsky, wearing a bright tunic and a trace of expensive eau de cologne, was buying a cake for a young lady, do not take an oath that the cake would ever reach the young lady and not be sliced up instead by the knives of the men searching the captain and then delivered to him in his first cell. No, one certainly cannot say that daylight arrest, arrest during a journey, or arrest in the middle of a crowd had ever been neglected in our country. However, it has always been clean cut, and most surprisingly of all, the victims, in cooperation with the security men, have conducted themselves in the noblest conceivable manner so as to spare the living from witnessing the death of the condemned. Not everyone can be arrested at home with a preliminary knock at the door, and if there is a knock, then it has to be the house manager or else the postman. And not everyone can be arrested at work either. If the person to be arrested is vicious, 
then it's better to seize him outside his ordinary milieu, away from his family and colleagues and from those who share his views from any hiding places. It is essential that he have no chance to destroy, hide, or pass on anything to anyone. VIPs in the military or the party were sometimes first given new assignments, ensconced in a private railway car and then arrested en route. Some obscure, ordinary mortal, scared to death by epidemic arrests all around him and already depressed for a week by sinister glances from his chief, is suddenly summoned to the local party committee where he is beamingly presented with a vacation ticket, a Sochi sanatorium. The rabbit is overwhelmed and immediately concludes that his fears were groundless. After expressing his gratitude, he hurries home, triumphant, to pack his suitcase. It is only two hours till train time, and he scolds his wife for being too slow. He arrives at the station with time to spare, and there, in the waiting room or at the bar, he is hailed by an extraordinarily pleasant young man. Don't you remember me, Pitor Ivanovich? Pitor Ivanovich has difficulty remembering. Well, not exactly, you see, although... The young man, however, is overflowing with friendly concern. Come now, how can that be? I'll have to remind you. And he bows respectfully to Pyotr Ivanovich's wife. You must forgive us. I'll keep him only one minute. The wife accedes, and trustingly the husband lets himself be led away by the arm. Forever or for ten years. The station is thronged and no one notices anything. Oh, you citizens who love to travel, do not forget that in every station there are a GPU branch in several prison cells. That was pages 6 to 9. Now we're going to page 6970. Fate of the man who stopped applauding first. Here's one vignette from those years as it actually occurred. A district party conference was underway in Moscow province. It was presided over by a new secretary of the district party committee, replacing one recently arrested. At the conclusion of the conference, a tribute to Comrade Stalin was called for. Of course, everyone stood up, just as everyone had leapt to his feet during the conference at every mention of his name. The small hall echoed with stormy applause rising to an ovation. For three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, the stormy applause rising to an ovation continued. But palms were getting sore and raised arms were already aching and the older people were panting from exhaustion. It was becoming insufferably silly even to those who really adored Stalin. However, who would dare be the first to stop? The secretary of the district party committee could have done it. He was standing on the platform and it was he who had just called for the ovation. But he was a newcomer. He had taken the place of a man who'd been arrested. He was afraid. After all, NKVD men were standing in the hall, applauding and watching to see who quit first. And in that obscure small hall, unknown to the leader, the applause went on. Six, seven, eight minutes. They were done for. Their goose was cooked. They couldn't stop now till they collapsed with heart attacks. At the rear of the hall, which was crowded, they could, of course, cheat a bit, clap less frequently, less vigorously, not so eagerly, but up there with the presidium where everyone could see them, the director of the local paper factory, an independent and strong-minded man, stood with the presidium. Aware of all the falsity and all the impossibility of the situation, he still kept on applauding. Nine minutes, ten. In anguish, he watched the secretary of the district party committee, but the latter dared not stop. Insanity to the last man. With make-believe enthusiasm on their faces, looking at each other with faint hope, the district leaders were just going to go on and on applauding till they fell where they stood, till they were carried out of the hall on stretchers. And even then, those who were left would not falter. Then, after 11 minutes, the director of the paper factory assumed a business-like expression and sat down in his seat. And, oh, a miracle took place. Where had the universal, uninhibited, indescribable enthusiasm gone? To a man, everyone else stopped dead and sat down. They had been saved. The squirrel had been smart enough to jump off his revolving wheel. That, however, was how they discovered who the independent people were. And that was how they went about eliminating them. That same night, the factory director was arrested. They easily pasted ten years on him on the pretext of something quite different. But after he had signed Form 206... The final document of the interrogation, his interrogator reminded him, don't ever be the first to stop applauding. Now we're going to on page 85, and this is about something you probably haven't heard of. This is uh, at the end of World War II. Okay, we read here. 
Along with them were seized not less than one million fugitives from the Soviet government, civilians of all ages and of both sexes, who had been fortunate enough to find shelter on Allied territory, but who in 1946 and 1947 were perfidiously returned by Allied authorities into Soviet hands. And then there's a footnote here, at which reads as follows. It is surprising that in the West, where political secrets cannot be kept long, since they inevitably come out in print or are disclosed, the secret of this particular act of betrayal has been very well and carefully kept by the British and American governments. This is truly the last secret, or one of the last, of the Second World War. Having often encountered these people in camps, I was unable to believe for a whole quarter century that the public in the West knew nothing of this action of the Western governments, this massive handing over of ordinary Russian people to retribution and death. Not until 1973, in the Sunday Oklahoman of January 21, was an article by Julius Epstein published, and I am here going to be so bold as to express gratitude on behalf of the mass of those who perished and those few left alive. One random little document was published from the many volumes of the hitherto concealed case history of forced repatriation to the Soviet Union. Quote, after having remained unmolested in British hands for two years, they had allowed themselves to be lulled into a false sense of security that they were therefore taken completely by surprise. They did not realize they were being repatriated. They were mainly simple peasants with bitter personal grievances against the Bolsheviks. Unquote. The English authorities gave them the treatment reserved, quote, reserved in the case of every other nation for war criminals alone, that of being handed over against their will to captors who incidentally were not expected to give them a fair trial. Unquote. They were all sent to destruction on the archipelago. Now we're going to page 130. Uh, the way to defeat interrogation. Just a couple of paragraphs. So what is the answer? How can you stand your ground when you are weak and sensitive to pain, when people you love are still alive, when you are unprepared? What do you need to make you stronger than the interrogator and the whole trap? From the moment you go to prison, you must put your cozy past firmly behind you. At the very threshold, you must say to yourself, My life is over, a little early to be sure, but there's nothing to be done about it. I shall never return to freedom. I am condemned to die, now or a little later. But later on, in truth, it will be even harder, and so the sooner the better. I no longer have any property whatsoever. For me, those I love have died, and for them I have died. From today on, my body is useless and alien to me, only my spirit and my conscience remain precious and important to me. Confronted by such a prisoner, the interrogation will tremble. Only the man who has renounced everything can win that victory. Now to page 146. This is the fate of one as already decided. The Blue Caps understood the workings of the meat grinder and loved it. In the Zeta camps in 1944, interrogator Mironenko said to the condemned Babish with pride in his faultless logic, interrogation and trial are merely judicial corroboration. They cannot alter your fate, which was previously decided. If it is necessary to shoot you, then you will be shot, even if you are altogether innocent. If it is necessary to acquit you, then no matter how guilty you are, you will be cleared and acquitted. Kushnaryev chief of the first investigation department of the West Kazakhstan province state security administration laid it on the line in just that way to Adolf Sivilko. After all, we're not going to let you out if you're a Leningrader. In other words, a communist party member with seniority. Just give us a person and we'll create the case. That was what many of them said jokingly and it was their slogan. What we think of as torture, they think of as, a good, as good work. The wife of the interrogator, Nikolai Grabyshchenko, the Volga Canal Project, said touchingly to her neighbors, Kolya is a very good worker. One of them didn't confess for a long time, and they gave him to Kolya. Kolya talked with him for one night, and he confessed. Now to page 156, a man who arrests his own wife. Just a paragraph. The possibility did exist, however, if you were well informed and had a sharp Czechist sensitivity of getting yourself out from under the avalanche, even at the last minute, by proving that you had no connection with it. Thus it was that Captain Sayenko knocked the Kharkov Czechist carpenter of 1918-1919, who was famous for executing prisoners with his pistol, punching holes in bodies with his saber, breaking shin bones in two, flattening heads with weights, and branding people with hot irons, but perhaps a relative, 
was weak enough to marry for love an ex-employee of the Chinese Eastern Railroad named Kokanskaya. And suddenly he found out, right at the beginning of the wave, that all the Chinese Eastern Railroad people were going to be arrested. At this time, he was head of the security operations department of the Arch Archangel GPU. He acted without losing a moment. How? He arrested his own beloved wife. And not on the basis of her being one of the Chinese Eastern Railroad people, but on the basis of a case he himself cooked up. Not only did he save himself, but he moved up and became the chief of the Tomsk province in KVD. Page 168. And this item is The Line of Good and Evil Through Every Heart. This is a famous passage here. Just a few paragraphs. If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? During the life of any heart, this line keeps changing place. Sometimes it is squeezed one way by exuberant evil and sometimes it shifts to allow enough space for good to flourish. One and the same human being is at various ages, under various circumstances, a totally different human being. At times he is close to being a devil, at times to sainthood. But his name doesn't change, and to that name we ascribe the whole lot, good and evil. Socrates taught us, know thyself. Confronted by the pit into which we are about to toss those who have done us harm, we halt, stricken dumb. It is, after all, only because of the way things worked out that they were the executioners, and we weren't. If Malyata Skaratov had summoned us, we too probably would have done our work well. From good to evil is one quaver, says the proverb, and correspondingly from evil to good. From the moment when our society was convulsed by the reminder of these illegalities and tortures, they began on all sides to explain, to write, to protest. Good people were there too, meaning in the NKVD and the MGB. Okay, finally, I want to go to page 173 to 175. And we're going to uh, hear about ideology. To do evil, a human being must first of all believe that what he's doing is good, or else that it's a well-considered act in conformity with natural law. Unfortunately, it is in the nature of the human being to seek a justification for his actions. Macbeth's self-justifications were feeble, and his conscience devoured him. Yes, even Iago was a little lamb too. The imagination and the spiritual strength of Shakespeare's evildoers stopped short at a dozen corpses because they had no ideology. Ideology, that is what gives evildoing its long-sought justification and gives the evildoer the necessary steadfastness and determination, that is, the social theory which helps to make his acts seem good instead of bad in his own and others' eyes, so that he won't hear reproaches and curses, but will receive praise and honors. That was how the agents of the Inquisition fortified their wills, by invoking Christianity. The conquerors of foreign lands by extolling the grandeur of their motherland, the colonizers by civilization, the Nazis by race, and the Jacobins early and late by equality, brotherhood, and the happiness of future generations. Thanks to ideology, the 20th century was fated to experience evildoing on a scale calculated in the millions. This cannot be denied, nor passed over, nor suppressed. How, then, do we dare insist that evildoers do not exist? And who was it that destroyed these millions? Without evildoers, there would have been no archipelago. There was a rumor going the rounds between 1918 and 1920 that the Petrograd Cheka, headed by Yuritsky, and the Odessa Cheka, headed by Dietsch, did not shoot all those condemned to death, but fed some of them alive to the animals in the city zoos. I do not know whether this is truth or calumny, or if there were any such cases, how many there were. But I wouldn't set out to look for proof either. Following the practice of the blue caps, I would propose that they prove to us that this was impossible. How else could, could they get food for the zoos in these famine years? Take it away from the working class. Those enemies were going to die anyway, so why couldn't their deaths support the zoo economy of the Republic and thereby assist our march into the future? Wasn't it expedient? That is the precise line the Shakespearean evildoer could not cross. But the evildoer with ideology does cross it, and his eyes remain dry and clear. Physics is aware of phenomena which occur only at threshold magnitudes, which do not exist at all until a certain threshold encoded by and known to nature has been crossed. 
No matter how intense a yellow light you shine on a lithium sample, it will not emit electrons. But as soon as a weak bluish light begins to glow, it does emit them. The threshold of the photoelectric effect has been crossed. You can cool oxygen to 100 degrees below zero centigrade and exert as much pressure as you want. It does not yield, but remains a gas. But as soon as minus 183 degrees is reached, it liquefies and begins to flow. Evidently, evil doing also has a threshold magnitude. Yes, a human being hesitates and bobs back and forth between good and evil all his life. He slips, falls back, clambers up, repents, things begin to darken again, but just so long as the threshold of evil doing is not crossed, the possibility of returning remains, and he himself is still within reach of our hope. But when, through the destiny of evil actions, the result either of their own extreme degree or of the absoluteness of his power, he suddenly crosses that threshold, he has left humanity behind and without, perhaps, the possibility of return.